Support for Ben Franklin's World comes from the Omohundro Institute of Early American History and Culture, proud citizens of vast early America and publishers of the William and Mary Quarterly, the leading journal of early American history since 1943. To learn more about the William and Mary Quarterly and how you can enjoy some of the best scholarship on the vast world of early American history, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash WMQ. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's world will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 131 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present-day world we live in. The United States has a complicated relationship with the idea of empires. At times, it has wanted to be an outward-facing empire with colonies and territories to call its own, and at other times, it has turned inward and declared itself to be an anti-imperial power. To understand why the United States has such a complicated relationship with empire, all we need to do is dig into the United States' early American past. That's where we'll discover that the fledgling United States gained its independence and came of age in a world full of empires. And if we go back into the 1790s, some of us may see the tension that came with early Americans' ideas about empires. For example, some of us may see the Federalists as favorers of empire, because some Federalists believe that the United States should try to replicate the imperial strength of Great Britain. At the same time, we may also view the Democratic Republicans or Jeffersonians as being against turning the United States into an empire, because they generally disliked Great Britain and favored the seeming democratic revolution taking place in France. With these traditional school-taught viewpoints in mind, it may surprise you to learn that the leader of the Democratic Republican Party actually favored the idea of empire. That's right, Thomas Jefferson envisioned the United States as becoming a great and vast empire of liberty. Frank Cogliano, a professor of American history at the University of Edinburgh and author of Emperor of Liberty, Thomas Jefferson's foreign policy joins us so that we can get a better handle on how Jefferson, the man who drafted the Declaration of Independence, which severed the Americans' ties with the most powerful empire in the mid to late 18th century world, was in fact a supporter of empires. During our exploration of this issue, Frank reveals Thomas Jefferson's vision of the United States as an empire of liberty, why Jefferson believed that the United States needed both land and free trade to function as a republic, and details about how Jefferson's vision for the United States informed his diplomatic and executive decisions. But first, throughout our conversation, you're going to hear Frank use the term vast early America. Vast early America is how many scholars of early American history now describe our field of study. It's a term that an Omohundro Institute scholar came up with to articulate the fact that when we think about and study early American history, how it developed and all that impacted it, we're really thinking about and studying four centuries of history spread across four different continents. It's an idea that historians have all known for a while, and one you've actually known for a while too, because this podcast is centered on the idea that each episode will explore early American history in its broadest sense. That's vast early America. So there you have it. Now you know what Frank means when he mentions vast early America, and you can take heart in the fact that you've already been immersed in this idea by listening to episodes of this podcast. All right, are you ready to discover how Thomas Jefferson became a proponent of empires? Let's go meet our guest historian. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Our guest is a professor of American history at the University of Edinburgh. He's a Boston Red Sox fan, a fact that should always be noted when possible. And he researches the political, cultural, and diplomatic history of the Revolutionary and Early Republic periods. He has authored and edited nine books, including Thomas Jefferson, Reputation and Legacy, and, most recently, Emperor of Liberty, Thomas Jefferson's Foreign Policy. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Frank Cogliano. Thanks a lot, Liz. Great to be here. So, Frank, I find this really curious. You're a native of Massachusetts, and yet you've spent a lot of time studying Thomas Jefferson. So, I have to ask, why Jefferson and not, say, one of Massachusetts' revolutionaries like John Adams, James Otis, or John Hancock. I mean, here in Massachusetts, we have so many founding fathers to choose from. 
Why did you go down south and choose Jefferson? Well, that's a good question, Liz. It was a little bit of an accident. I went to the UK in 1992. I went to a small college in Southampton in England for what I thought would be a year. I ended up spending five years there and subsequently in 1997 went up to Scotland to the University of Edinburgh where I'm now based. And how does that lead to Thomas Jefferson, you might well ask? Well, in the late 90s and the early years of this century, I was casting about for a project to do, and I spoke to an editor from a particular publisher in the UK, which published a series of books on the historical reputations of prominent figures. And she suggested to me that I might want to do a book on Jefferson, and I originally wasn't all that enthusiastic about it, I have to confess. However, it appealed to me on a practical level, on a very kind of practical and personal level, which was that at that time, I had very young children. My wife is a doctor in the National Health Service in the UK. She was at that point what they call a junior doctor, like a resident in the US, and working about 80 hours a week. So the prospect of me taking off for one or three or six months at a time to do archival research in the US, that wasn't really a possibility for me at that point. And so I thought, well, this is a... this relatively brief book, as I then conceived it, wouldn't necessarily require me to spend a lot of time on the road because what I really needed was access to a decent library. And I'm very, very fortunate in Edinburgh to be blessed with very, very good library resources, both in the university's library, but also the National Library of Scotland, which is a very short walk from my office. And I thought, well, based primarily on these two institutions, I could probably do this in a relatively brief period. And that would be that. And I thought I'd write this one short book on Jefferson's reputation. That project ended up evolving into my first book on Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson, Reputation and Legacy, which I published with Virginia, not with the press that originally approached me. It was very, very different from the original project. But having started to work on Jefferson, and I thought I'd do one book. It's a bit like my move to the UK. I thought, well, I'll just go for a year. Here I am 15 years later still writing on Jefferson, because once you start, it's difficult to stop. Now, when you say you have good research libraries in Scotland, for those of us who don't know what it's like to research early American history or Thomas Jefferson outside of the United States, why do good libraries matter? I mean, what information are you able to access and find about Jefferson and early American history in the libraries of Scotland? Yeah, that's a really good question, Liz. I mean, that first book was a little bit different from what I've done subsequently in that it was meant to be initially, at least as I originally conceived it, a look at the way historians have treated Jefferson over the years. And that being so, what I really needed was access to a really good research library. The National Library of Scotland is a copyright library. It's one of, I think, four copyright libraries in the UK. And this means that it has copies of every single book published in the United Kingdom that has a copyright. And so the NLS, as we call it, is an incredible resource for anything you want to work on. It's a bit like the Library of Congress. It's a library of everything. Having said that, it's got very, very good databases and the e-resources are excellent. And of course, it's got substantial archive holdings for the current project I'm working on, which I think we'll talk about at the end. I've recently been doing some research there that's Jefferson related in the papers of Henrietta Liston, who was the wife of an early British diplomat in the US. And she has wonderful insights in her letters and journals, wonderful insights and often quite caustic opinions about major American politicians in the 1790s. So there's a lot out there outside of the United States and the places we traditionally associate with early America, to be sure. Even the vast early America as we now define it. That sounds pretty great. And I have to imagine that as a copyright library, you probably have access to every documentary edition ever published containing all the published papers of Jefferson and probably every other founding father for that matter. That's right. So to some extent, the world really has shrunk to the extent that I can write about Jefferson in Edinburgh almost as well as I could. I happen to be, as you're doing this interview, I'm at Monticello at the moment on a brief research fellowship, and that's wonderful. But I could almost do a lot of the research I'm doing in Edinburgh as well as in a place like Charlottesville within sight of Jefferson's home at Monticello. Now, earlier you mentioned that you started with one book on Jefferson, and now you seem to be working on a third book about him. So... What is it about Jefferson's life and ideas that you really think we still need to research and explore? That's another really good question, Liz. I get this all the time, especially from family and friends who don't necessarily share our passion for early American history, who will say, surely the world doesn't need another book on Jefferson. The thing about Jefferson that is so appealing to an historian, at least to me, is, well, it works on a couple of levels. In the first instance, his documentary legacy is so substantial, 40,000 letters, 
hundreds of thousands of pages, memoranda and state papers and things like that. And his interests are so varied and so wide that you can write about almost any aspect of early American history during his lifetime. And, you know, we joke about Jefferson and this, Jefferson and that, but you can make those connections. And so he offers a window into our world, not the only window, not the only perspective, and certainly a perspective that's limited in important ways. But he really does offer us some really, really powerful insight into many, many aspects of that vast early America. He's also, and you know, we perhaps can talk about emphasizing dead white men and great figures in history. I don't subscribe to that view of history myself, but you know, he's not just another individual. He is the, you know, the man who articulated the American creed, even as he failed in certain key respects to live up to it, as we have over the past 240 years. But you know, he's a crucial figure in the history of the American Revolution and the early Republic. And so I think it pays to study him in that respect as well. And finally, I'd say, you know, because the documentary legacy is so rich, as I say, as you interview me, I happen to be at Monticello and I can look out my window and, you know, I'm looking at one of the best documented slave plantations in history. Because of his documentary legacy, we know so much about the enslaved people at Monticello. So we get a real window into early American society and fresh perspective every time we look at Jefferson, even though it may seem that everything's been set. All right. So it's time for us to look through one of these many windows that Jefferson opens up onto vast early America. An emperor of liberty, Frank charged Jefferson's ideas about what the United States as an empire of liberty would look like and how Jefferson sought to bring his ideas about the empire of liberty into being with his foreign diplomacy. Frank, what were Jefferson's ideas about the United States as an empire of liberty, and how did he envision the nation functioning within the world as an empire of liberty? Well, I chose the title of my book, Emperor of Liberty, and you're quite correct, Liz, to put your finger on this concept of the empire of liberty. And I chose that title to, if you will, emphasize Jefferson's agency in creating what he frequently referred to as an empire of liberty. And he often referred to the United States as an empire of liberty. Sometimes he called it an empire for liberty. And I think that phrase is really, really important and really telling. We citizens of the United States are frequently uncomfortable seeing the United States as an imperial power, in part because we believe our history and the foundation of the country, quite rightly, is as an anti-imperial power. Of course, we are one of the first nations to emerge from a colonial independence movement. And we saw colonial independence movements around the world from the late 18th century until the mid 20th century. And the United States sees itself as an anti-imperial power as a consequence. And so it seems incongruous to us that Jefferson, this man who articulated the American creed, as I said a few minutes ago, would use this phrase to describe the United States. So on one hand, it works at an ironic level. On the other, he's using empire in a way we don't. And I think the ambiguity is interesting and actually quite productive to think about. So to some extent, he's using empire just to mean a really, really big polity. And it's not necessarily associated with negative connotations. On the other, he's acutely aware that the world is dominated by empires, the British Empire, the Russian Empire, and so on. Later in his life, the French Empire under Napoleon and during his presidency. And he's using empire of liberty to contrast the Republican government of the United States with those other empires. He sees the world as a world dominated by warring empires, governed by monarchs, kings, queens, emperors, and so on. And the American empire, the empire of liberty, is meant to be something entirely different. It's a republic. And because it's a republic, it is intended, and it's premised on the liberty of its citizens and guaranteeing and expanding the liberty of those citizens, with the crucial qualifications about who's entitled to citizenship and so on. And so it's a rebuke to a world of empires. Jefferson always chooses his words carefully, and I think he's aware of the ambiguities of describing the United States as an empire of liberty. And I think it's crucial to our understanding his view of the world. And the reason I call him an emperor of liberty is empires need emperors. And I'm trying to look at the actions he took to realize this empire of liberty. And there's a real paradox there because he uses as I try to show in the book, he uses executive powers in ways we don't often associate with Jefferson. I won't say it's in a high-handed way, but he's not afraid to take executive action to achieve his ends. 
And so I think this phrase Empire of Liberty works on a number of levels, and it's really, really rich. Before we go on to exploring Emperor Jefferson and how he looked at his empire, could we talk about what he identified as the two needs of the American Republic, land and free trade? What were Jefferson's ideas about land and free trade, and why did he think that both were important for the American Republic to emerge as an empire of liberty? Thanks, Liz. And this requires some elaboration and clarification. Jefferson famously said in the notes on the state of Virginia that those who till the earth are God's chosen people. And he meant that. And he was talking about himself, not necessarily the enslaved people who actually tilled the earth for him, but those who work in agriculture, those who depend on agriculture are God's chosen people because the ideal citizens of this Republican empire, of this empire of liberty, should be independent farmers. He distrusted cities, he distrusted manufacturing, he distrusted the political economy that Alexander Hamilton espoused. He didn't want Americans to be subsistence farmers, though, barely eking out a living, you know, on marginal land. Rather, he wanted them to prosper. In order for them to do this, they would have to trade. So although he believes manufacturing has baneful influences that would ultimately lead to corruption that would undermine the virtue of the citizenry and undermine the foundation of a healthy republic, he recognized that Americans wanted stuff in manufactured goods and would seek them. And so he wants manufacturing to remain in Europe. So if Americans are to maintain a standard of living to which they aspire and to which they demand and he himself is a great consumer of imported goods, they need access to markets. So they need land so that the United States can remain a nation of farmers as population grows. But they also need access to trade. And this is often, I believe, kind of understudied and underappreciated about Jefferson's political economy. They need access to markets abroad in order to sell their produce and also to get the manufactured goods they need. So there's a crucial balance to be struck. He's hoping, he subscribes to kind of the stadial theory of history that we get from the Scottish Enlightenment, that countries like people go through life stages. In order for the United States as a republic to remain kind of young and vigorous and healthy, that is free, its people must remain independent. And they achieve that independence by living on their own land and exporting their produce and importing what they need. So he subscribes very strongly to free trade. And I argue in the book that a lot of attention has been given to his desire to acquire land for the United States, and that's crucial. The corollary to that is also free trade and access to markets. Earlier, Frank mentioned that Jefferson was not averse to exercising executive power. And I'd love for us to take a look at Jefferson as an executive, because in 1779, the Virginia General Assembly elected Thomas Jefferson governor of Virginia. So Frank, would you tell us more about Jefferson's tenure as governor? I mean, if I recall this period correctly, wasn't he the governor who abandoned his post and ran away from the British? Oh, Liz, you're a federalist. Well, I'm from Massachusetts. (laughs) Yes, you're a monocrat from New England. His tenure as governor of Virginia is, shall we say, difficult. He's governor of Virginia at a time from 1779 to 1781. He serves consecutive one-year terms, which are very, very difficult for the Commonwealth of Virginia. It's a time when the British repeatedly invade the state. During the War of Independence, Virginia had largely been spared through much of the War of Independence. But at the very, very end, in 1780 and 81 in particular, Virginia, to a large extent, becomes the seat of war, especially in 1781. And this, unfortunately for Jefferson, coincides with his tenure as governor. Now, it should be said that because of the limitations of Virginia's wartime constitution, which is quite a Republican document, the governor has relatively limited powers, and Jefferson has very limited means at his disposal to counter these British invasions. So it's not clear to me, certainly, what he might have done. You alluded to his flight from Monticello in June of 1781, which is the low point of his public life, and indeed, I would argue, his life. On his deathbed in 1826, he is trying to convince Henry Lee, who's the son of Light Horse Harry Lee, to amend his father's memoirs, which were quite critical of Jefferson's tenure as governor and his actions as governor. And Jefferson was accused of cowardice because he was accused of fleeing from the British from Monticello when they occupied Charlottesville in June of 1781. And also abandoning the governorship. This is where things get a little complicated because his term as governor had expired or was expiring at the beginning of June 1781. So he believed he was done. 
the House of Delegates had not been able to elect another governor because the government had had to abandon Richmond because the British occupied it. And so the legislature was in flight. Everybody was in flight in Virginia at that point. And so they didn't select a successor. So Jefferson's critics complained that he made the allegation that he basically abandoned his office and therefore abandoned the state at its hour of peril. He said, no, 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 my term was up. And so, you know, I was acting in my capacity as a private citizen. The British briefly occupied Monticello. He could have stayed and been captured, but he did not do so, which was, I think, was a fairly sensible decision. He stayed until the last possible moment, I think, to appear to be brave and to try and, you know, as an act of defiance before he fled. So he sent his family ahead of him, and then he followed them down to Poplar Forest, his summer retreat near Lynchburg. This combination of events dogged him for the rest of his days. It dogged him. He was subject to allegations of cowardice and so on and criticism, and he was very, very sensitive about this. The Virginia Assembly in the autumn of 1781 created a board of inquiry to look at what Jefferson did, and that board actually exonerated him, which is very, very interesting. In December of 1781, after Yorktown, the war is winding down. The perspective seems very, very different in December of 1781 than it did in June. But he was very, very sensitive about this. Why it's important, apart from its impact on Jefferson's reputation, I think, why this series of events is important is it teaches him that as an executive, one has to make decisions quickly and decisively. I won't say he dithered, but he took too long to make decisions in the winter of 1780-81 and then the spring of 1781 during the British invasion. I don't think at the end of the day it would have made a difference because Virginia was in a relatively weak position, and I don't think it might have mounted a slightly better defense in the face of these British invasions had he been more decisive, but perhaps not. However, I believe that the lessons he would draw from this experience as president would be to take more decisive action when necessary, and that safeguarding the physical boundaries and physical safety of a republic is the primary responsibility of the executive. So I think he learns important lessons from his disastrous tenure. And I think it is disastrous. There's no other way to, to put it. Although I think he's incredibly unlucky. You know, certainly we joke and you're right. Jefferson was in a really tough spot. I mean, Virginia was not set up to defend itself against the British. And, you know, that wasn't all that uncommon during the war for independence. There were so many states that were woefully ill prepared for invasion. Well, that's right. And most of the Continental Army is divided into Washington has a significant proportion of the army around New York City watching the British. And then the rest of the army is further south and north in South Carolina at this point under General Nathaniel Green trying to counteract Cornwallis, who will eventually go to Virginia, of course. And so Virginia is, as you say, not unlike many of the states. The British army is strong enough to go where it wants to go through much of the War of Independence. So I think Jefferson learns important lessons during his tenure as governor as a result of this British invasion. I'm not sure what he really could have done about it. So Jefferson's wartime experiences as governor really teaches him that he needs to take decisive action to protect the republic. And this is an idea he carries with him into his new role as diplomat. So, Frank, would you tell us how Jefferson applies this executive lesson as the United States' minister to France? Sure. During his tenure as minister in France in the 1780s, he carries on a very, very interesting conversation and discussion and debate with his then friend, a future enemy and then future friend, (laughs) John Adams, about how to deal with the Barbary states in North Africa. And the Barbary states in North Africa basically interfere with the shipping of different European and extra European powers like the United States, the new United States. Prior to independence, American shipping was protected by the Royal Navy, of course. After independence, that's no longer the case. And so American ships are being captured and their crews are being held for ransom by Tripoli, Tunis, Algiers, and Morocco in North Africa. Jefferson's proposed solution to this problem is to fight. Jefferson wants to, if necessary, put a coalition of small powers together, so Naples and Denmark and Malta and places like that, and the United States, to wage war on the Barbary states to ensure that American ships have free passage in the Mediterranean. And remember what we said earlier about the importance of trade to his vision for the American Republic. Adams doesn't support this idea. Adams recognizes that the Barbary states are a problem, and he says we should just pay them off. That's what the major European powers do. That's what the British and the French and the Spanish do. And the payment, you basically negotiate a treaty and you pay annual tribute. 
And it's galling, sure, but it's basically like paying a toll to do business. And Adams has a fairly hard-headed approach about this. He says, look, the profits to be made by trading in the Mediterranean far outweigh the cost of paying tribute. And so we'll just have to grin and bear it. Jefferson, who's been derided in part because of his disastrous governorship, but kind of throughout history, as a kind of, he was once called by a historian 30 or 40 years ago, a halfway pacifist. Jefferson actually says, no, 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 we should fight because this is a matter of principle. And he clung to this view for a long, long time. Nothing actually came of it in the 1780s. And during the 1790s, the Federalist administrations of Washington and Adams will basically negotiate to pay tribute to the Barbary states. But he never really gives up on this idea. And so he's willing to, as he sees it, wage war in concert with allies to protect American interests and principle. And so this is, again, I think it's a relatively small example, but it's a good example of how he took the lessons he learned as governor and sought to apply them when he was a diplomat. And then later, you know, we see during his presidency that he will wage war on Tripoli. And these are the roots of that particular conflict. That's really surprising to me that Jefferson wanted war with the Barbary states. I mean, as you noted, we typically think of Jefferson as being averse to conflict. And here, when it comes to the Barbary states, he seems to be a war hawk. Yes, I think that's true. Now, he's he's a war hawk when it comes to smaller powers. He's not as eager to wage war on Britain or France, for example. But he is much more bellicose than we suppose, I think. I think his general reputation, as you say, is that he's not a pacifist, but that, you know, he's conflict averse. He's certainly conflict averse when it comes to his interpersonal dealings. I mean, he gets into lots of political conflicts, but he doesn't like conflict on a personal basis. And we see him as conflict averse more generally, but I don't think that's an entirely accurate picture. Where the power is won, the adversary is one who the United States has a reasonable chance of winning in contest with. He's willing to use force. Now, before Jefferson became president, he served as secretary of state. And as Frank noted, he definitely chose his battles wisely, with his preference always being to pick battles with smaller countries. So, Frank, would you tell us about the Nootka Sound incident that took place during the Washington administration? How did Jefferson negotiate that incident, given that he doesn't want the United States to get picked on, but he definitely doesn't want to go to war with Great Britain? Sure. I mean, that's a very interesting incident that tells us something about Jefferson's approach to statecraft. The Nootka Sound crisis of 1789 and 90 has nothing to do with the United States in its first instance, except that what happens is that Britain and Spain come into conflict over their claims to Vancouver Island off modern British Columbia threaten to go to war in 1790 over this. President Washington raises this issue with his cabinet to the extent of saying, what should our position be in the event of a war between Spain and Britain? Not least because it's entirely possible with the British in Upper Canada, modern Ontario, and the Spanish in the Southwest and in the Floridas, that the United States might literally come between Britain and Spain in the event of a conflict. Jefferson's approach to this is very, very pragmatic and almost cynical. He is willing to threaten Spain. He says, well, what we should do is say to Spain, you should give us Louisiana and the Floridas because then there'll be no cause for Britain to attack you. So just give it to the United States. Now, he knows that's not going to happen or he seems thinks that's unlikely to happen. What they really want is free access to the Mississippi. So you demand lots of things, but the one thing they really want is free access to the Mississippi because remember how important trade is. And that's the main artery for Western American farmers, the bedrock of the Jeffersonian Republicans to get their goods to the wider world. And so he wants to kind of essentially bully Spain, take advantage of Spain's relative weakness at this point to see what kind of concessions he can get. Meanwhile, with Britain, you know, Hamilton says, what are we going to do if the British want to march across our territory, if they want to march across the Northwest and use the Mississippi River to go attack the Spanish in the event of a war? And Jefferson argues, again, I think quite realistically, for prevarication. He said, well, in the first instance, we won't answer them. We'll just ignore it and see whether anything happens. If pressed, we'll probably have to let them go. On the other hand, we might be able to use British pressure to extract concessions from Spain, and he's already articulated some of those. And, of course, we could possibly extract some concessions from Britain to allow them to cross American territory. So he's quite, I think, pragmatic in seeking to exploit this crisis. The crisis eventually passes, nothing comes of it. But he's seeking to take what is a relatively weak American position to exploit it for the best possible outcome. 
which is what he sees as his job as Secretary of State. So I think it's a relatively small incident, particularly because no conflict arose. But his approach and the kind of instructions he's giving to William Carmichael, who's the American ambassador at Madrid at the time, are very, very interesting as far as his attempts to extract concessions from powers that are stronger than the United States. But he seeks to exploit the relative weakness of Spain during that crisis. That's really interesting and really bold of Jefferson to try and figure out how to exploit the big powers of Spain and Great Britain, given that both countries had way more resources and military power than the United States did at the time. But I guess I see the allure, right? Because for Jefferson, free trade is so critical to his plan for making the United States an empire of liberty. Frank, did Jefferson ever secure free navigation of the Mississippi River? Well, eventually the United States will get it in the mid-1790s after he leaves office, the Secretary of State. But to some extent, that is a legacy of his earlier negotiations. So he lays the groundwork for that because that's crucial. And of course, he'll eventually get it when France reacquires Louisiana from Spain during his presidency. It's a complicated story, actually. There are actually Spanish government officials in New Orleans and in Louisiana at this point, although it's been returned to France and the Spanish closed access to the mouth of the Mississippi to Americans. That's going to prompt the crisis that leads to the negotiations that result in Louisiana purchase. So the acquisition of the right of deposit, as it's called, and the right of access to the mouth of the Mississippi in the mid-1790s is a legacy of Jefferson's earlier work. And obviously, the acquisition of the Louisiana Territory in 1803 is a, you know, the signal achievement of his presidency. And those are both about access to the Mississippi. So as governor of Virginia, Jefferson learned that an executive has to take decisive action to protect the republic. And as minister to France and secretary of state, he learned how to actually interact with foreign powers and how to negotiate by exploiting their weaknesses, work he gladly undertook to gain freer trade and land, which he believed were critical for the United States to function as an empire of liberty. And all of this brings us to his next career phase, which is that of vice president. You know, after a brief retirement between 1794 and 1796, Jefferson stood for political office again. In fact, he ran for president, but he came in second to his once friend turned political foe, John Adams, which means that Jefferson had to serve as Adams's vice president. Frank, would you tell us about Vice President Jefferson? What work in diplomacy did he undertake in this role? His vice presidency is a very interesting period, and I'm using interesting in a kind of euphemistic way. It's interesting for both Adams and Jefferson. They're both unhappy with this situation. Imagine if Secretary Clinton had to serve as vice president to Mr. Trump. That's essentially how Jefferson felt in 1797 when he was sworn in as vice president as a consequence of losing the 1796 election. He and John Adams enjoyed a close friendship, and there was a profound affection and respect between them, although that would deteriorate very rapidly over the subsequent years. He wasn't terribly diplomatic, and he wasn't terribly loyal as vice president, in part because Jefferson's vice presidency or Adams's presidency is the first time And we've got an incipient party system here, but it's the first time in American history because Adams had served two terms as Washington's vice president. But it's the first time that the vice president and the president really are on opposite sides of the political fence. And Jefferson very much emerges as and acts as leader of the opposition while serving as vice president to John Adams. So it's a really, really bizarre set of circumstances. And he's not that actively involved in diplomacy, but he opposes many of Adams's policies. I mean, the major foreign policy issue during the Adams presidency is the quasi-war with France. And Jefferson's opposed to the quasi-war. And Jefferson particularly opposes the domestic legislation that's adopted during the quasi-war, the Alien and Sedition Acts, which are basically measures adopted to limit and circumscribe civil liberties in anticipation of a declaration of war against France. And Jefferson's opposed to that. And he flirts with, in the Kentucky resolutions, state nullification, arguing that states can nullify federal actions if they see them as unconstitutional. This is Jefferson as the kind of spiritual godfather for a very brief period of time of the Confederacy in 1860 and 61. And so he's a very, very disloyal member of the Adams administration and Adams's cabinet because he's opposed philosophically to Adams's actions, but particularly Adams's foreign policy in the form of the quasi-war with France. He has very little authority to do anything about it. So he's actually got less authority to some extent as vice president than he had as secretary of state previously under Washington. 
As Secretary of State, he'd been at odds with Hamilton and elements of the Washington administration's programs. But as vice president to Adams, he's really the leader of the opposition, which is a really awkward and anomalous position for both Jefferson and John Adams. You noted that Jefferson was really opposed to the Alien and Sedition Acts, which the Adams administration and Congress passed into law in an effort to keep the United States out of war with France. These acts and how they divided Adams and Jefferson is important. So, Frank, would you tell us about the Alien and Sedition Acts and specifically what Jefferson took issue with? The Alien and Sedition Acts were actually, in my reading of them, adopted in anticipation of a likely declaration of war with France. They weren't about keeping the United States out of war so much as preparing the United States for war. And so the Alien and Sedition Acts, as the name suggests, are anti-immigrant. They extend the amount of time that immigrants have to wait before they can become citizens and vote. And this particularly affects the Jeffersonian, the Democratic Republicans, because immigrants tend to vote Republican in this period. And so the length of time that immigrants have to wait to become citizens is extended from five years to 14, I believe it is. The Sedition Act is modeled on British sedition laws, which severely limit the ability of newspaper editors and publishers to criticize the government. And again, these acts were adopted in the expectation that the United States was going to declare war on France in 1798. Ultimately, John Adams resisted the real popular pressure to ask Congress for a declaration of war. And so that declaration of war never came. This legislation remained on the books, however, and was seen as particularly threatening to the civil liberties of Americans by many, and particularly by the Jeffersonian Republicans. And it became the issue upon which Jefferson ran against Adams in 1800 and gave real impetus to the Republican opposition to Adams. So it's really the first domestic crisis of civil liberties in American history. Some might argue the Whiskey Rebellion was of 1794, but the adoption of the Alien and Sedition Acts in 1798 is a real turning point in the history of the early republic. And it puts Jefferson in stark opposition to the administration of the Federalists and John Adams in particular. And Jefferson, well, Jefferson and James Madison drafted and ushered through a series of resolutions through the Virginia and Kentucky legislatures called the Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions, which basically asserted that individual states could nullify actions of Congress, which they deemed unconstitutional. So it's a potential constitutional crisis as well. Although these resolutions went nowhere, no other states endorsed them. The Alien and Sedition Acts and serving as Adams' as vice president also added to Jefferson's experience, experience he took with him into the White House in 1801. Now, earlier we discussed Jefferson's views on the Barbary states, which he developed as the United States' minister to France during the 1780s. And as president, Jefferson confronted the Barbary states again. So, Frank, would you tell us about President Jefferson's views on the Barbary states and whether they had changed and whether he took the decisive action that he longed to take when he was minister to France? Sure. In May of 1801, Jefferson held an early cabinet meeting soon after his inauguration in March. And the cabinet discussed what to do if one of the Barbary states, and they were particularly worried about Tripoli at this point, declared war on the United States. And the records of that meeting are relatively brief, but they're very, very interesting and important and enlightening because the cabinet discussed how to respond to such a provocation. Now, I need to kind of interrupt myself and offer one parenthetical observation, which is that in the Barbary states, it was customary to renegotiate treaties whenever there was a change of ruler. So when the Pasha of Tripoli died and was succeeded by another Pasha of Tripoli, that would lead to a renegotiation of all the treaties of tribute that were on the books. And the Tripolitans, as they're called, the people in Tripoli, interpret a change of administration in the United States in a similar fashion. So as they see it, a declaration of war, a formal declaration of war, is to a certain extent an invitation to negotiate. The Jefferson administration is not going to see it this way. And so Jefferson and his cabinet meet in early May of 1801, and they discuss and they debate what to do in the event of a declaration of war by Tripoli on the United States. And their decision is to send the Navy or elements of the Navy to North Africa to wage war against Tripoli. And the crucial discussion that goes on at that meeting, or a crucial element of that discussion, concerns whether this is constitutional or not. And so we have a very, very early discussion over what we would come to call war powers and presidential war powers. And the view of the cabinet, and certainly Jefferson's view, 
and remember his experience as governor, is if somebody else declares war on you, it's the fundamental responsibility of the president to act to defend the United States. Congress was not in session in the spring of 1801. Congress didn't meet until the end of the year, usually. And Jefferson's view and the cabinet's view was if another state declares war on the United States, a state of war exists. It need not be declared. And it's the fundamental responsibility. In fact, uh, the president would be negligent not to respond to that. And so the sending of the Navy to North Africa is both legal, it's constitutional, and indeed, it's a moral imperative in the face of a declaration of war. And that Congress will have its say when it's called into session eventually, or when it comes into session eventually, because of course it can vote on the budget and so on and so forth, but that a declaration of war was not necessary. And ironically, at almost exactly the same time that the cabinet was meeting, the Pasha of Tripoli, Yusuf Karamanli, ordered the American flag to be cut down in the American consulate in Tunis, which was a form of declaring war. And so he declared war on the United States just as the cabinet made this decision. Now, of course, it's well before CNN and 24-hour news that they were taking these steps in ignorance of each other. But it's a really, really important moment. And Jefferson dispatches the Navy to the Mediterranean. The war goes on for several years. <laughs> Elements of it are disastrous. The USS Philadelphia is captured and its entire crew is imprisoned at one point. But Jefferson commits at one point almost the entire U.S. Navy to the Mediterranean to wage this conflict between 1801 and 1805 eventually. And he believes that it's necessary to do, it's legal, and it's essential to do to protect American interests. What lessons do you think we should take for our own 21st century from Jefferson's 18th and 19th century experiences of trying to build an empire of liberty and of taking decisive executive action to defend that empire? This is a good question, Liz. We'll go back to Jefferson's reputation where I began my journey. Much was made in his lifetime and afterwards about him being a halfway pacifist and all this kind of stuff. Yet, since 9-11 and since 2001, we've had this kind of total revision of Jefferson as this guy who waged war against the Barbary states and waged war against terrorism. And so the Barbary War is seen as the first war on terror. I think this is nonsense. The Barbary War is about trade. It's not about religion. He's not waging war on terrorism. And it's ahistorical and deeply problematic. So the one thing I would say in answer to your question is we need to be careful in drawing these lessons across the centuries. Having said that, I think Jefferson did understand that the world is an uncertain and dangerous place, and it's necessary for the executive to take action sometimes. So he's got a fairly capacious view of the constitutional authority given to the president to take action without consulting Congress in advance. And so he would seem to be arguing for greater presidential power. However, there's a crucial qualifier to all this. He recognized that in a crisis, the president must act, an executive must act. And it's better to ask for forgiveness than ask for permission, because it's not always possible to ask for permission anyway. However, it is necessary to ask for forgiveness. So the president can't act for years and years on end without consulting Congress. Even as governor of Virginia, he acknowledged the flaw in the Virginia Constitution was that the governor was required to consult his counsel all the time. And that when the British invaded the state, that was just physically impossible to do because the council wasn't quarried and it was scattered around the state. And so he took action and then he said, well, the council will have to approve this retrospectively. As president, he believes that he can send the Navy to North Africa, but the Congress will have to give its approval in the form of appropriating funding to pay for it. And so he does recognize that while a president can act in a crisis, his power or her power ultimately will be limited by the fact that crises pass and Congress must be consulted and ultimate authority rests with Congress. I think that is a lesson for us in the 21st century. Since 1945, with the rise of the national security state, we've given more and more power to the presidency to deal with crises, however defined. But Congress has increasingly lost or abdicated its responsibility to exercise oversight in the long run. So Jefferson recognize that presidents need to respond to a crisis and to use force if necessary, but also recognize that that force had to be guided by and was ultimately subject to Congress. So I think that is a lesson for the 21st century. Now it's time for the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The time warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. 
opinion, if Jefferson had not worked against the Adams administration and had actually supported the Alien and Sedition Acts, which many view as anti-French acts, would Jefferson's presidential administration have been able to negotiate the Louisiana Purchase with France in 1803? I think probably yes. The reason being, while the French were concerned about what they perceived as the anti-French tendencies of the Adams administration, I don't actually think that the policies of the United States figured all that much in Napoleon's decision to sell Louisiana in the end. I think that, you know, as has been said by many other people, including on your podcast, you know, what's going on in Haiti is far more important in determining the fate of Louisiana than what was going on in Washington. I think Jefferson very skillfully exploited an opportunity that was presented to him, but the key decision that was taken that resulted in the sale of Louisiana was taken by Napoleon once he'd given up on his American empire. Perhaps a more interesting question is what if they'd been unwilling to sell or those negotiations had collapsed? You know, what if Napoleon had sought to really pursue his empire in North America despite the loss of Haiti? In that case, I think there probably would have been war between the United States and France in the first decade of the 19th century, which means there may not have been a war of 1812 in the second decade of the century. But I don't think Jefferson's response to the Alien and Sedition Act would have prohibited him from exploiting that opportunity five years later. When we started our conversation, you noted that you're presently on a research fellowship at Monticello. And I wonder if you would tell us about your fellowship and what you're working on. Sure. I'm here at the International Center for Jefferson Studies which offers short and long-term fellowships, which I would recommend to anybody. It's a splendid place to work with Andrew O'Shaughnessy and his colleagues. What I'm working on is I'm just at the beginning of a new book project on Jefferson's relationship with George Washington. And I am astounded to say that there is no book-length treatment of this. In fact, there's relatively little treatment of it. We have books on Jefferson and Hamilton, of course. We have books on Washington and Hamilton. We have books on Jefferson and Madison. Nobody has written about what I really think is a crucial relationship, not least because they represent two very different visions of the revolution. And they're, to some extent, the two most important leaders that emerged from the revolution. But there is no book on Jefferson and Washington. Where's the best place to look for more information about you, Frank? And what's the best way to contact you if we have any questions about Jefferson? Sure. I mean, I welcome people to get in touch with me. You can find me on Twitter at at Frank Cogliano. You can also email me at f.cogliano at ed.ac.uk. That's my email address at the University of Edinburgh. And I'm happy to speak to people further. It's a great deal of fun. My colleague, David Silkenat, and I, who's an Americanist at Edinburgh as well, we are launching our own podcast, which we have a tentative title of The Whiskey Rebellion, emphasizing American history and Scotland in that it's meant to be a little bit of a pun. We're launching this podcast and we're intending to provide a kind of international perspective, but also a historical perspective as two Americans living outside of the United States on the new presidency in the years to come. So keep an eye out for that as well. Frank Cogliano, thank you so much for taking us through Jefferson's executive and diplomatic experiences and for showing us how we can use those experiences as a window onto broader issues of early American history. My pleasure, Liz. Thank you. Thomas Jefferson still fascinates historians. And it's largely because he left such a rich and substantial documentary legacy. Jefferson generated hundreds of thousands of pages of written records that tell us not only a lot about Jefferson and his ideas, but also about life in early America. Using Jefferson as a window, we can see that after the revolution, early Americans were trying to figure out what kind of an independent nation they wanted the United States to be. They lived in a world dominated by empires. But did they want the United States to become an empire? This proved to be a fraught question. And through Jefferson and his papers, we can see how some early Americans grappled with it. Many early Americans wanted their nation to become a powerful and strong country that could protect its citizens and allow them to prosper. Jefferson believed that the United States should become an empire, an empire of liberty. And to allow the United States to rise as an empire of liberty, he needed to secure it land and free trade and take decisive executive action to protect it. This is why Jefferson attempted to be a decisive executive and diplomat. And as Frank's work reveals, Jefferson's ability to take decisive action was a skill that he developed over the course of his very long career, and one that always kind of led back to his ideas about turning the United States into an empire of liberty. You'll find more information about Frank, his book, Emperor of Liberty, plus everything we talked about today 
on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 131. The Omohundro Institute of Early American History and Culture is a proud supporter and citizen of vast early America. And one of the many ways that the OI supports vast early America and a better understanding of it is by publishing the William & Mary Quarterly, the leading journal of early American history since 1943. To learn more about the William & Mary Quarterly and how you can enjoy some of the best scholarship about early American history, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash WMQ. Finally, what lessons do you think we can take from Thomas Jefferson's experiences for our own 21st century? Send your answers to liz at benfranklinsworld.com, tweet me at Liz Covart, or post a comment in our listener community on Facebook. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.